Paris. City of love, romance and dreams. So they say. I used to say it too. But ever since that day, the day of the murder, I've always associated my beloved Paris with death. I was at home having a bath when my editor called. Collard, get your ass over to the Palais Royale now. You got an interview. With Pierre Carchamp. Yes, the Pierre Carchamp. No photos, so leave your gear at home. He has for you personally. Don't ask me why. Anyhow, this could be big, so if he makes a pass, don't forget. Just smile, say yes, and keep taking notes. So charming, and so very apt. Pierre Carchon was a media king, a national hero, and one of the most infamous adulterers in Europe. He and his wife Imelda were just one step down from royalty. Whoa, I hate mimes, but unless you humor them, they don't go away. Here I was, the palace of the media king and the ice queen. I pressed the doorbell and set in motion a chain of events which would change my life forever. Yes, what is it? Madame, my name is Nico Collard. I'm here to see Monsieur Carchon. Come up, we're on the first floor. Madame Carchon, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yes, I'm sure. The Ice Queen was certainly living up to her reputation. Will you be staying for the interview? Mademoiselle, I know little of my husband's business affairs, and I care even less. I certainly have no intention of watching him pour over yet another pretty little journalist. Pretty? You're too kind, madame. Ah, the talented and very beautiful Mademoiselle Collard. Such a pleasure to meet you at last. Monsieur Carchon, I am honored. Oh, I'm sure you are. Call me Pierre, please. But I do not flatter you idly. I was a friend of your father. He was a great man. My father? He never mentioned. He and I were very close. And then his death. So tragic. I must... Imelda, your damned cat's in my study again. Another Ming vase, I suppose. Excuse me for one moment, my dear girl. You journalists are getting younger each year. Perhaps it's the rest of the world getting older, madame. That was no cat. My God, what? Monsieur Carson? He's dead. I must call the police. You'd better stay here. There was a man. It was the mime. Do you think he... Well, I believe we can rule out suicide, don't you? No wonder they called her the Ice Queen. She would have been top of my list of suspects if I hadn't seen the attacker myself. And if I hadn't come across a couple of murders just like this already. One of the most important men in Europe, murdered. 
And here was I, Nico Coulard, alone at the scene of the crime. Should I wait for the cops? Or start my own investigation? It was a no-brainer. Mimes and guns don't usually go together, but I had an idea that this was no ordinary mime. I'd come across this murderer before, and written about him. The costume killer, at least that's what I'd called him. It was one of my hair clips. My favourite, in fact. It must have fallen when I was knocked down. Some people hate searching corpses for clues. Me, I'm okay with it. Reminds me of an old boyfriend. In his pocket, I found a ticket stamped Bateau de la Conciergerie. Taking the ticket meant I tampered with the evidence. There was no going back now. Carchon had been shot. I closed his eyes. It was the least I could do for the poor fellow. I opened his eyes. Best to leave the crime scene as I found it. The bookcase was filled with obscure first editions. A bust of Pierre Carchon, humble servant of La France. The police could turn up at any minute. Somewhere there were clues to the murder, and I needed to find them. A Louis XIV table with an antique cloth. Imelda had taste. But hey, with a husband that rich, taste is easy. A magnificent antique table. I reckoned that cloth might just turn out to be useful. Even my fingernail wouldn't fit into such a small hole. Aha! Nico, you are just so damn good at this stuff. Instead of comforting Imelda, I was ransacking her flat. Why? Because there was something going on here, and I had to get answers before the cops arrived. And hey, she'd been rude to me, so she had it coming. A key. Maybe a safe key. It was a tube of acrylic paint, French ultramarine. Just the colour I was after for my bathroom. I'm sorry, I have to go. Someone is... Young lady, what are you doing? Oh, this paint. <laughs> it's my favourite colour. For God's sake, keep the damn stuff. Excuse me, madame. Yes? I am so sorry for your loss, madame. No, you're not. You're a journalist. Journalists don't feel sorry. Not true. We shall see. How did your husband know my father? I have no idea. You didn't know him? Thierry Coulard? Pierre knew a lot of people I didn't know, most of them women. Why would a mime want to kill your husband? Pierre had plenty of enemies. Half the husbands in Paris for a start. Why did your husband send for me? 
What did he want to discuss? I have no idea his business was his business. He never told you anything? No, and frankly, I preferred it that way. This is quite a scoop for you. I suppose you're already inventing the headlines. Just because I am a journalist. Don't patronise me. You're all cut from the same cloth. Do you have any moral sense at all? Yes, that's why I do this job. You do it to see your name in print. As if. My editor gets the byline, I just do the work. Well, don't expect my sympathy. The police will be here soon, madame. Is there anybody you would like me to contact? Family? Friends? No. I have no family. Pierre and I were... He was all I had, really. Not much, was it? The dutiful wife. That was my role. He never talked, never let me in. I know one thing, madame. What? If you want to find out who killed your husband, then you let me do the job, not the police. Why? How do I know I can trust you? Because you have no choice. The police will take weeks, in which time your own life may be in danger. What? Believe me, this killer has struck before, and he will strike again. Who is to know that you are not next on his list? I don't know. All I need is a few more minutes to look around before the police come. You really do have a moral sense, don't you? I trust so few people. And I share your low opinion of the police. Here, take this. It's the key to the drawing room next to the library at the end of the hall. It was Pierre's room. I rarely went in there. I couldn't. I was too scared of what I might find. Thank you. I promise you won't regret this. The door was locked. Now we were getting somewhere. The painting showed the cachons together, in love. As the poet said, the past is a different country. Or did I read that in a fortune cookie? There was the very faintest of clicks. Behind the picture was a safe. The safe was locked. I needed the key. In the safe was some kind of artifact. There were strange symbols on its surface. It looked like the printer's blocks I'd made at art school. If there was one thing I'd learned about symbols, they are always important. But these symbols scratched into stone were impossible to read. I needed to find a way of printing them. At least the stone was round. But what could I use for ink? And what could I print on? Sure, I was stealing, but I knew Imelda didn't know about the artifact, and Carchon was past carrying. This wasn't the time for me to lie on the sofa doing my Marie Antoinette impression. Though it is very popular at parties, especially with gay guys. Don't ask me why. As expected, the desk was yet another priceless antique, yawn. The blotter and in tray had clearly been placed with mathematical precision. My heart skipped a beat. It was a carved elephant. But not just any carved elephant. It had been made by my father. I knew for certain because in my apartment I had its exact twin. 
carved into a box he had made. So Cochon had known my father. They really must have been friends. I decided to take the carved elephant. It clearly meant nothing to Imelda. I didn't need a sheet of blotting paper. Not while it was blank. The paint would have just soaked into the blotting paper, but the idea was good. I didn't want to take the tray, but I knew that I could use it. I'd spread blue paint over the bottom of the tray. It was ruined. I was a very bad, bad girl, but also quite a clever one. I rolled the artifact in the paint until it was completely coated. An antique tray with paint spread all over it. Not a lot I could do with that. Genius! The roller and the paint worked just as I planned, but what did it say? It was some kind of coded message. It read, Sub Judici. I may not have learned a lot as a journalist, but that was a term I knew well. It means a legal case that is before the courts. Below it was a sequence of letters that made no sense. I suddenly realized there was a connection between the boat ticket and the coded message. The boat ticket was stamped Bateau de la Conciergerie. The Conciergerie on the Ile de la Cité, by the river, housed the ancient law courts. So, sub judice could in this case mean literally under the law courts, below the conciergerie. I was pretty sure I'd found all I could here. And besides, all this opulence was making me pine for my regular life of poverty. This was a huge story. It was also one heck of a puzzle with a lot of pieces missing. But I was going to crack it. And if I could just remember the name of that fancy prize you get for being an ace journalist, I was definitely going to win it this time. Did you find anything useful? This carving. Do you know anything about it? It was Pierre's. What does the statue have to do with... Please, I need to know. He was given it by a friend. Something to do with Africa. He never explained any more? No. But I think it was important to him. Always on display. Why? It was carved by my father. Oh, I see. I didn't know. Imelda, I will do everything I can to find the killer. Thank you, my dear. And if the police ask, don't worry, you were never here. Sub judice was the key. I was going to have to find a way under the conciergerie. I decided to head straight for the quayside on the Ile de la Cité. If there was a way of getting under the conciergerie, it would have to be from there. Canchon wasn't the type for messing about on the river. He was up to something down here. Something that got him killed. An old boyfriend of mine owned a barge once. Dumpest relationship I ever had. In every way. The fence wouldn't move. This fence wouldn't move either. I 
tried pushing the fence, but it wouldn't move. A strange pair of locks stopped the latches from releasing the gate. One down, one to go. Nothing like a good convent education for honing your lockpicking skills.
for a room full of junk that was one very sophisticated lock system. This place was definitely fishy, in more ways than one. Oops. Moving a skiff would only damage it more. An old shell case. I wondered what that was doing there. The cloth was embroidered with an unusual symbol. The brass case was smooth and perfectly round. The words sinister and dexter were carved on either side. Now any good convent girl like me knows the old Roman for left, right, left, right. But what did it mean here? Mystery solved. Carchon's stone cylinder slotted into the hole with a satisfying click. Rolling out the painted cylinder had given me a print of a secret message. It read, Sub Judice. Below it was a sequence of letters, S D S S D S S. A satisfying click told me I turned it to the right position. It felt like tumblers in a safe. Another click, another step closer. I love the sound of locks clicking open. I removed the stone cylinder. Oh my god! The slab came down with a hell of a force. With nothing to hold it up, the cross dropped back down again. Lifting the cross closed the entrance door and also opened some kind of stone panel. Ingenious. The stone slab had flattened one end of the shell case. The panel wouldn't move. If I was going to get a closer look at the panel, I'd have to find a way of keeping the cross up.
The stone cross was propped up. Now I was getting somewhere. I touched the slot. Nothing bad happened, which was good. I've always been attached to my fingers. This slot was designed for something specific. But what? The artifact slotted into the hole perfectly. Behind the old walls, I could hear some kind of mechanism groaning into life. But whatever had been triggered had now jammed. I removed the shell case. The cross didn't drop back down. Some kind of mechanism was holding it up. The gap was too thin for me to get a grip. I needed something thin enough to prise the door open. Another good use for a shell case. Another secret room. Somebody had something to hide. But was it what I was looking for? Wow! Through the darkness, I could see that this was a stateroom. But for what purpose? And how did it tie in with Carchon? Amazing! The thing still worked. The room lit up bright as day. I wasn't going to find anything in this old desk. It hadn't been used for years. Inside the drawer, I found a note, written in some kind of code. It was pretty clear from the lack of dust that someone had been working very recently at this desk. This was the article I'd written about the costume killer. My suspicions were right. Conchon had cut it out. Two businessmen had been killed, one in Italy, one in Japan. In each case the killer had worn a costume, a penguin, and then a snowman. But that wasn't the only link between the two murders. Both the victims had been big media do-gooders, and I proved they were just the opposite. So, how did they fit in with Carchon? Oh my god! The sheet was a printout with my personal information. Everything from my favorite food to my waist size. They were right about chocolate, but come on guys, I'm a size 10. There was even a picture of me taken with a telephoto lens. Carchon wouldn't have taken these pictures himself. This was big. And organized. I was part of it. And people were getting murdered. Don't you just hate it when that happens?
A photo, long lost, had fallen down the back of the drawer. It was very old, but there was no mistaking the guy in the foreground. Carchon. Behind him were soldiers, a burning village and a corpse. The photograph was cropped on the right-hand side. Somebody else in the picture obviously didn't want to be in it anymore. I wasn't surprised. This was Africa in the 60s. An uprising was being brutally suppressed. And here was Mr. Media himself, Carchon, doing the suppressing. The photograph was not just powerful evidence. It was also my ticket to one explosive story. The photograph showed Carchon smiling happily to camera with a background of burning huts and death. Full report to follow, but this is too urgent to wait. Arno and Yamada both dead. This is not a coincidence. Indeed, it seems that all of us who came together in July are in danger. Take great care. X. I wasn't the only one to make the connection between the costume killer murders. I'd been right all along. That was why he had asked to meet me. But what did I know that he didn't? I had enough for a story. An amazing story that was going to make my reputation and blow Conchance to pieces. I needed to get home fast and start typing. Bonsoir, Coulard. Nico, it's Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie, you cracked open the champagne yet? Are you crazy? What's wrong? Wait a minute. You didn't print it, did you? Of course I didn't print. That's the best piece I've written. The last, as far as I'm concerned. It's important. It's suicidal. You can't destroy a national hero. He deserved it. His corpse isn't even cold. Ronnie, two hours ago I told you what I'd found. You loved it. You begged me to write it up immediately. Two hours is a long time in newspapers, Nico. Someone's got to you, haven't they? Listen up, Nicole, and listen good. Pierre Carchon had a lot of friends. Powerful friends. For your own sake. Forget what happened. You got it. End of conversation. Good night. This should have been my big break, but I knew there was nowhere else to sell this story. If Ronnie wouldn't print it, nobody would.
Bonsoir, Cola. Mademoiselle Cola, my name is Plantard. I need to talk to you about your story, your Pierre Carchon story. How did you know about that? There are people out there, madame, who will be very upset by this story. Oh, really? Well, it's their lucky day. It's been spiked. Yes, I know. We must meet. We must? I have information relating to your costume killer stories. Tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., Café de la Chandelle Verte, Rue Alain Cour. I shall be wearing a grey overcoat. You must talk to no one about this. You can't tell me what to... Tomorrow at 8. I'll be waiting. People complain about newspaper articles all the time, but not usually before they're printed. I was beginning to feel scared. This guy, Plantard, could I trust him? Should I meet him or forget the whole business? I didn't have an answer.